Great. Okay, then uh, I'll start introducing our speaker for today. Um, I'm really, really happy to, first of all, meet Romain, because I think we've both been reading a lot of each other's work, um, but haven't really sort of talked to each other before. Um, so I'm really happy that we do that now. Um, because Romain has been doing some some really nice nice work. So he's a PhD student at Naver Labs, but also at the um, the sort of UVA. Um, he has done some really nice work in the past years, which has all revolved around using reinforcement learning in um, general like systems for information retrieval. Um, and so he's had papers at, at Wisdom, at CIR, at Transactional Information Systems all this year alone, I think. So really quite a good um, sort of track record. Um, I'm very curious to hear his perspective on on how we can bring reinforcement learning um, to the masses, let's, let's say. Um, so with that, um, I will, yeah, um, so we give the floor to you, Romain. Great, thanks for the introduction and the invitation, of course. Uh, so yeah, indeed, uh, reinforcement learning is kind of a central point in uh, what I do throughout my PhD. But rather than uh, you know presenting one method or one class of methods, uh, what I want to do today is kind of go over all the challenges of applying RL in recommendation. And um, yeah, this is basically this ex kind of exploratory work I do in my PhD. So this is uh, based on joint work with these people here. And uh, you know, also I'm also going to present many things that are not mine, but uh, fit the story. So I want to start by restricting the scope a little bit and uh, kind of divide the recommendation task into two subtasks. So I think first they, there could be some kind of a semantic aspect where you uh, try to understand users and items and you try to relate them. So you have features like history, who are users, how they access the platforms, and you have items with content, text, video, and so on. And uh, you know this is sort of an extension of an NLP task or a computer vision task, uh, because you, know, you have to learn some user characteristics and item characteristics from features in order to match them. Uh, so this is, of course, super important for recommendation, but that's not what I'm uh, focusing on. I rather focus on the dynamic aspect of recommendation. So here you have some variables of interest, like user satisfaction or uh, revenue from the perspective of a provider, or you know some sort of uh, fairness or societal wellness. And you want to control for uh, these variables. So typically for user satisfaction, that means you want to increase it to drive user engagement. And then you want to kind of keep it at a higher level to keep the user you know, happy about the platform and engage with the platform. So it's still the same setup. You have users and items. But now you realize that you know maybe users can actually select the items that they want to see. But also items have an effect on users because uh, you know they bring some information, right? So uh, it means that they will probably leave the user in a different state after seeing them, maybe more interested in something or less interested in something. And actually, if you take a step back, you see that often, you know, there is a system uh, recommending items to users, which means that now you have an indirect effect on of that system, so us, onto the users through these two arrows. And actually, that system is trained from users and items. So now you have uh, arrows coming in and out both ways, and you know everything is moving at the same time. So it's a bit tricky to understand what's happening. And you know there's also the world, which has an effect on both users and items because you know what's happening in the world can change um, user behavior and users' perspective on things, and also it can change item value because they, maybe then you know some items become outdated and some become relevant again. So the dynamic task here would be to model as best as we can all of these arrows so as to control the relevant variable, such as user satisfaction. And to reach this goal, I think there are some research questions that are super important. Uh, the first one would be uh, multi-step reasoning. Because as I said, you know, we want to increase user satisfaction, but we also want to keep it at a high level on a very kind of long run. So um, that means that we need to think ahead. So we need to think of the consequences of our actions, um, you know, later in a few steps down the road. And um, I'll focus on motivation for that, notably the fact that recommendations are performative. So I'll explain what that means in a little bit. And I'll show that basically RL is a natural fit for this uh, type of uh, problem. And so we can talk a little bit about that. Then. Uh, we will have a few obstacles along the way, 
And uh, the first one is that we have to learn from biased data. Uh, so there are different types of biases in the data, and uh, you know, I'll show what is the impact of these biases and some solutions to kind of overcome them. There is a second obstacle, it's uncertainty. Uh, there is a lot of uncertainty actually in the recommender system setup. And uh, you know, it comes from many different sources. So I'll talk a little bit about that and do kind of a comparative analysis of different RL methods under uncertainty. Uh, the last one I'm not going to talk about uh, because I don't think I have time for that. Uh, but uh, basically, when you want to do all of the above, but uh, you want to recommend multiple items at once, it makes the problem much more complex in every sense of the term because now you have to think about all of the potential combinations of items and you know effects it might have on the user and on future value. Uh, so yeah, problem is uh, very complex and large action spaces actually make this difficult. I just think it's worth mentioning, but I'm not going to talk about it today. Okay, so uh, let's start with uh, the multi-step reasoning. So as I said, you know, we have this variable of interest, and since everything is moving at the same time, we have to uh, kind of you know uh, account for the consequences of our decisions in this interactive system. Uh, so I want to concentrate on one thing, the fact that recommendations are performative. So that means that they have a causal effect onto the users and therefore on the like, future values of every variable in the system. So first, they can do that by shaping user preference. So, you know, typically, uh, I don't know, if you um, start with something, you want probably some kind of introduction, something very accessible. And then once you know the topic, you probably want items with deeper content. Also, you can just, you know, it can change your worldview and make you more interested in something, or it can be repulsive to you. Uh, so, you know, lots of different ways it can influence the user preference. It can also influence the user in a different way that is not about the preference, but about the general kind of user state. Uh, for example, if you recommend many times the same thing, it's possible that it causes boredom. And then, you know, the user gets bored, less engaged with the platform, and we probably leave. So we don't want that. So there is some empirical evidence for this. Uh, for example, here on the bottom row, you have data from the last FM data set. So this is like music streaming. And uh, we want to see where there is a correlation between, you know, listening many times to the same artist or the same track and the retention rate. So the likelihood of coming back to the platform the next day. And there is a massive confounder, which is the, um, the general activity of a user on the platform, because if you are an active user, you are coming back very often, and you also tend to listen many times to the same artist. Um, so let's adjust for this confounder, which they have done in this paper with uh, the different colors. And then we see that there is a downward trend, so there is definitely a correlation, and it suggests that you know people uh, with less diversified um, music experience, they also tend to be less engaged with the platform. So it suggests that we should actually do something about it. And, um, you know, this is music streaming, so probably that there are some recommendations in there, but it's mostly people choosing to listen to something. And uh, it's worth checking whether that is the case when you have purely recommendation-based impressions. So the top row here, uh, it's a short video recommendation platform. And um, we can basically see the same thing, right? So when you, uh, you know, users who watch too many videos from the same type, always the same type of topic, they also get less engaged with the platform. Uh, now, this is kind of the same example here from an, an earlier paper, consumption on Spotify this time. Uh, so, you know, less diversified experience is usually associated with higher churn rate and lower conversion to premium. Uh, then I think we have to talk about the um, potential ethical issues of recommendations being performative and us not accounting for it. And notably, they may create some filter bubbles or echo chambers. So I say may because you know sometimes it's a bit unclear whether that happens, or that happens because of the recommendations or something else. But at least what we know is that you know it is possible that it happens you know depending on your graph its characteristics its initial conditions and of course the type of recommender system that you use uh, and for example in this paper you know they showed that uh you know on the top row you can see there is some kind of polarization or echo chamber creation happening so since it can happen we have to make sure that it will not happen all right so we have a vague idea, but I'd like to define the problem in a proper way so, it, so that we can start building something. 
And I'm going to use a markup decision process. So it's very useful when you have interactive environments like this. Basically, it says that you know you have a certain environment state uh, about you know who are the user and what is their history, maybe how is the world right now. And our system, which is also called a policy, can take actions. And in this case, actions are items that you can recommend to the user. As a result of this recommendation, you get some feedback. So usually this feedback is scalar simply because it is much easier to optimize. And so we, we call that the reward. And what makes the whole thing interesting is the following error. It's the transition function. It's the fact that we there is an effect from the item being recommended onto the user state. And you know, in this interactive setup, our goal is to maximize, of course, the rewards that we get. But since there is this feedback loop here, we have to account for the consequences of decisions, which means that we need some kind of long-term objective. And this is usually the return, which is the sum of rewards along the whole user experience on the platform. Uh, actually, usually it's a discounted sum. As you can see, there is a gamma factor here. OK, so um, this is a general problem. And reinforcement learning is really fitted for this type of problem. But I'd like to stress the difference between a supervised learning approach and a reinforcement learning approach in that context. So in a supervised learning approach, you kind of split the decision process into prediction of a relevant variable and then you know, using that variable to make a decision uh, in the system. So the model is only responsible for the prediction part and usually there is some kind of hard-coded rule uh, that you know, translates that into a decision for, for the system. So you have to find a label uh, either by you know, uh, asking people or by finding something in the data. And then there is a kind of a matching task where you want to find the most likely prediction in a given context. And then you further use this prediction uh, to solve the, the, the dancing task. In the reinforcement learning approach, actually, these things are merged. So uh, the model is directly responsible for making the decision. And since we have a way to quantify the goodness of a decision uh, using the rewards, uh, return, or something that we usually call uh, the value function in reinforcement learning, so it's this V of Y, where Y is a sequence of decisions, then we directly want to find the best sequence of decisions in order to solve the task. So um, it's you know it's a bit more open-ended basically because any policy that solves the test that maximizes the value then is actually a good solution to a problem. You have basically two ways of doing that of estimating the value function. So in the Monte Carlo approach, you um, you know would collect a lot of data associated with a sequence of decisions. So you just apply these actions and observe the rewards, and then you can compute uh, this uh, value function or discounted return. And um, you know, then if you take the empirical average of this, that gives you an estimate of the value function. Uh, with a temporal difference approach on the right, uh, we use what's called the Bellman equation, which basically says that this sum, this discounted sum, can be separated into the first term and the future. So the first term is R0, and uh, the future term is gamma times the same discounted sum, but at the next time step. So that's why it's V of uh, Y prime here. And the trick is to use an estimate, our current estimate of the value function, to approximate you know, that uh, future term. So uh, this is much better in terms of efficiency, because you don't have to collect data for every sequence of decisions, but only for every individual decision. But you know, it comes at the cost of bias, because this estimate, uh, we have no guarantee it's good. So it has been proven that you know most of the time it works, uh, but still this is kind of an unstable thing, and uh, it will be the source of many of our problems. Uh, so I'll come back to that a bit later. Just keep that in mind. So I'm not going to des describe every method out there. Uh, these are the standard references for RL. They still do a pretty good. They still do a pretty good job. So you can check them out if you want. I want to talk about evaluation, though, because if we cannot evaluate, there is no point in training. And uh, you know, when you look at what's being done in sequential recommendation, especially from a more semantic perspective, uh, usually uh, the, the, the protocol is something related to next item prediction. So that means you have a sequence of items that you consider to be your label. So uh, you, know, you can find it typically in your data by um, keeping only uh, what you think is desirable in the data. So for instance, you know, if you think of an IMDB type of platform, you come into rate movies 
and probably that you want to be able to predict you know the movies that people liked not the one they didn't like so you will if you remove the one they didn't like which is why I put this one in dashes here and then you try to predict the movies they like so you ask the model to make predictions and um in actually what you do is to ask the model to rank its preferences over items so here for example it says uh, this is the order of items uh, according to my guess and uh, the purple item, the, the good one, appears uh, at the second position, which is actually quite a good guess. So we have a relatively good NDCG of 0 0.63. And then for the next time step, so you uh, you know use the past as input and you make a guess. Okay. And uh, this time it's actually a pretty good decision, and NDCG is one. So yeah, same here. Now if we take a step back and think about why we use RL here and why you know what, what are we trying to do. The thing is, you know, RL, it, it's good because it's a user-oriented paradigm. You directly optimize, you know, for the user metric that you care about. And it's also um, long-term aware because there is this, you know, multi-step thing with, like, the, the future being taken into account. And also, it's, as I said, you know, it's more open-ended. Like, you can recover any type of policy as long as, you know, it maximizes the user metrics. And next item prediction is actually the exact opposite. So it is only accuracy-oriented. You try to predict, uh, you know, a certain item, but you're not making sure that it translates to good user metrics. It is myopic. It's always a single step decision here, and it mimics existing behavior because you, you know, typically you find this sequence of item in the data. But there could be a better sequence of item, you know, that would, you know, solve the task in a better way than that. So I don't um, advise using it because it's just not adapted to this, you know, dynamic aspect of recommendation. And instead, we can resort to uh, other things. So I would say, first and foremost, online evaluation. Um, you know, we are trying to interact with a live system to change something in the live system. So the best we can do is to try our intervention, our intervention, sorry, in the live system and see what happens. Um, you know, there are many uh, things to to get right. Of course, you know, it's uh, there can be some caveats, and actually, Olivier here has worked on that, but it's still kind of a gold standard. If you cannot do that, or you know you are in between two deployments and you still need to get some intermediary results, then you have things like of policy evaluation, where you try to estimate the value of your policy given data that comes from a different policy. So there are lots of methods to do that, and also like different tasks like OPS, which is a slight nuance of the OPE task, and you know. It cannot really match the performance of online evaluation. Sometimes it fails, uh, notably because uh, inverse propensity scoring has high variance. This is a very well-known result. I'd like maybe to talk about one uh, problem that is maybe less well-known. It's the fact that, you know, often what you will do is train an algorithm uh, of policy and also evaluate it of policy. But, you know, every OPE method can also be used for training. For example, IPS, you can just use the same uh, uh, rescaling ratio thing uh, for training. And if you use the same method for training and for evaluation, uh, then there is some kind of bias because, you know, the method will make the same mistakes during training and during evaluation. So from the perspective of that method of that OPE, your candidate policy is perfect, even though it might not be. So, um, yeah, just be careful about that. Maybe, you know, ensembling of estimators uh, could be a good idea as well. In general, don't trust too much of policy evaluation. Uh, this is a library to uh, to apply OPE on RL policies, so I can really recommend it. I think it's uh, really good. And now I'd like to talk about a complementary type of evaluation, which is simulators. So this is a bit tricky because um, simulators, you know, by definition, they are not a guarantee of anything. Uh, they uh, are synthetic, which means that you cannot expect your policy that performs well on the simulator to also perform well uh, in the downstream task uh, when you deploy it online. Still, if you have uh, researchy type of questions, I think it's useful because then you can, uh, you know, just make a lot of experiments, changing a little bit some key parameters every time, and then you can identify some general trends about the algorithm. So uh, that's actually, I think, quite useful to really understand what's going on, you know, because sometimes that's also a problem, for example, with online evaluation. It can be a bit opaque, right? You just have a result, but you don't really know how to improve. And this, this could be actually a way to, to understanding a bit more what's happening. Uh, 
So usually you want to make it um, as close to reality as possible uh, by using real users and real items so that the semantic information is there. And then you want to play with the dynamics of a simulator. And this is you know, the big challenge. You have to kind of find a, a way of doing that. Um, yeah, in this paper, I think they do a pretty good job, uh, you know, uh, taking the semantic information and then, you know, adding their own dynamics rule and see uh, whether algorithms can keep up with it. So I can recommend reading this. Okay, there is still one thing I haven't talked about when it comes to the shortcomings of meta next item prediction is the fact that it is not robust to mistakes in the off policy selection process. So this is the same example as before. So we have a you know relatively good NDCG because the I mean that's the item was placed second, but actually we don't really care whether it's placed second or even last because this item is never going to be recommended. At inference time, what you do is an argmax over uh, you know your preferences, and so the one you're going to recommend is the first one. But you have no guarantee that this one is good. You know, it could be really bad, and. You know, when you take recommendation from a semantic perspective, I think this is not a big issue because, you know, one and two are likely to be related. Also, you're going to kind of average over many, um, uh, many instances of this. Uh, so I think it gives you a pretty good idea of how semantically correct your representation learning algorithm is. But once you start doing RL, this is a big issue because actually the first one, this argmax, is very likely to be kind of an overestimated item that doesn't really make any sense. So I'll talk a little bit about that in the next part, but first uh, let's um, get some takeaways for this part. So because of the uh, ambition of controlling uh, user uh, variables on the long term, we need a multi-step thinking. And uh, reinforcement learning is kind of a natural fit for this. Uh, unfortunately, to evaluate it is not so straightforward. And the things that we usually use in sequential recommendations or next item prediction, it's not really adapted to that task. So you know we have to resort to something else, probably a combination of whoops, <laughs> online off policy and simulated evaluation. Uh, okay, so. This is basically an idea of the setup. So we have an idea of you know what to do, uh, but if we try to do it, we have a first obstacle along the way, and it's the fact that we have to learn from data, but this data is biased. Firstly, it's biased because of selection bias. So that means that you know in a given user state, you might observe different uh, items with uh, different probabilities. So all items do not have the same probability of being uh, shown to the user in your data. And um, here, for example, the second item was impressed um, where well, it has a higher probability of being recommended, so it has more importance in the data. And that's the first issue, and it's kind of a distribution shift issue where since we're going to change the policy, we're going to change something from that. So maybe with a new policy, the first item is going to be more important in the data. And we have to account for that, and that's why you know people like to use things like important sampling or IPS so that you kind of push down the importance of the second item, push up the importance of the first item so that they have kind of equal importance. Then the second issue you can have is a statistical significance issue. If you have a very low probability of observing an item, then you probably don't have enough data on this item to estimate its value. And you know, if you just push up its importance with important sampling, uh, then you are pushing up something that is not reliable. So it might create a lot of mistakes. And this is why you know, we say that IPS has a lot of variance. So for that, I think you can use things like the doubly robust estimators um, that do a better job as, uh, at doing that. Um, so actually, a few months ago, you had a talk uh, by Ari Osterhaus uh, about this. And I think it's a great explanation of uh, these concepts. So you can watch this talk if you haven't already. Um, the third problem is kind of obvious, but I mean, if we don't have data, we cannot invent anything. So um, can we do anything there? Actually, we can maybe sometimes uh, using um, the fact that, you know, even if we haven't observed this particular item for this particular user state, maybe we have observed it for a different state, maybe a neighboring state. And then you can maybe elaborate causal inference techniques to learn the causal impact of that item onto uh, the value. And uh, maybe you can translate that to be serial state. So I say a lot of maybes and stuff because it's highly speculative. Uh, usually you need um, assumptions that you don't really have. 
So, you know, maybe, maybe not. So this is kind of a traditional selection bias thing uh, that you see a lot in bandit setups. But now I'd like to talk about something very specific to reinforcement learning and the fact that we have multi-step optimization. So this is a simplified environment where you have a one-dimensional state on the x-axis and your actions can be either go left or go right. Then if you want to plot the value function of that environment, for some reason there is a maximum. Which means that you know if you're left of the maximum, you have to go right. If you are right of the maximum, you have to go left. And let's say you have data, but only on one part of the space. So you have a lot of data, so yes, the machine is accurate, but it's only on one part of the space. And let's also get, say that your initial guess is this. So it's very good on the part of the space where you have data. You have really fitted that. Uh, but on the part of the space where you don't have data, and of course you cannot really invent it, so it's a bit off. And here it's slightly overestimated. And now we're going to try and use that uh, unstable Bellman update I talked about earlier. So uh, let's say, you know, if you consider the rightmost point in data here, and you consider the action of going right, then it you know, goes into a part of the space where you don't have data. And so your estimate here is overestimated, which means that when you plug it in in the Bellman update, and so you use it to update the value at this state, the one with the cross here, it's, you know, this overestimation is being propagated. So you end up with something like this. So now, even in the part where you have data, you have a slight overestimation. And then you can, you know, repeat that, and the error will be amplified and propagated. So you will end up with something like this. And then, you know, the, the policy that you get out of this uh, train value function is completely different from the true policy because now it says always go right to maximize the value. Um, so uh, that's definitely not what we want to do. And I mean, if you, you know, if you continue to do it, you will uh, see that it can go up to infinity, at least in theory. Uh, so then what you have is complete nonsense and you cannot rely on it. So this is the combination of three things. The op policy training, the fact that we use the unstable Bellman updates, and also that we use function approximation, because you know that's what enables this error to be propagated to neighboring states. And these three things together are called the deadly triad of offline error. So this is a really critical issue, and we need to do something about it. And if you uh, are used to like IR in general and uh, bandits and so on, your first reflex should be IPS, inverse propensity scoring. So we want to evaluate the value function of uh, our policy, pi, but we have data that comes from a different policy, which we call the behavioral policy or logging policy. So here it's pi beta. And what we're going to do is to rescale um, the, the reward that you observe, the value that you observe by this ratio, pi divided like by beta. And if you write it down uh, using the Markov decision process and the chain rule, you obtain this, and once you remove the useless terms here, what you have is a product of ratios. And that is really bad because, you know, any mistake in each one of the ratios is going to be multiplied by all of the others. So that means you have exponential variance in the sequence length, uh, and that is really bad because we know IPS by default has kind of a high variance, but if you make it exponentially higher, then, you know, it's just not usable. So usually people don't do IPS for RL. What they do is pessimism in the face of uncertainty. So that's a different paradigm. And um, the idea is that you know, if you have data, for example, here only in the right part of the space, and your naive uh, policy training would give you this, so a peak on the left part, you say, no, there is no data. I cannot trust it. So I'm going to push it down. So then you only take action in the parts where you have data. You have different ways of doing that. Um, doing this, uh, basically, it always involves the same thing. It's adding a penalty that relates to uncertainty, and you know it could be done at different points in the algorithm um, during policy training, value training, or even uh, at the reward function. So I'm not going to once again you know, describe every variant of this. The idea is just to apply uh, a penalty on uncertainty. Okay, so. Let's say this works perfectly. Of course, still, you know, sometimes it can be a bit hard, but let's say it works perfectly and we have solved selection bias, we still have an issue. We have presentation bias. It's the fact that the feedback, even when we have it, we cannot really rely on it. It's not really reliable. So here, 
This is a search scenario, but it could be a recommendation, it could be the same. So we have shown four items to the user. So that's what we have in the data. And uh, the third item is the most relevant one. As you can see, it has a probability of relevance of one, but it does not translate into a higher click probability. You can see that the first item has a higher click probability. And this is because of position bias. So it's the fact that you know users, it's uh, very, uh, I think, easy to understand. They first look at the first rank and then the second rank, and they have a lower probability to observe this item here. So even if it is very relevant, it has a lower click probability. So if we try to learn the value of this item naively, you know, we, we might think that the most relevant is this one. And then when we try a different policy, so we will change the ranking by definition, then suddenly the click probabilities are completely off. So the kind of solution to this uh, while learning from data is click modeling. So it's the idea that we must learn the causal factors that impact click probability and also you know, what exactly is their influence on click probability. Um, so as to enable this out of distribution prediction. So having a click prediction that holds even under a different ranking. And the idea of click modeling is to have a model that is constrained in its architecture in a way that encodes assumptions on the user behavior. Um, so this is a PBM here. It's uh, probably the simplest model out there. It postulates that the user uh, clicks on an item only if it has observed it and that this probability of observation or examination depends only on the position. So now we see that we model these two latent variables, uh, probability of observation and probability of relevance. And the one we are really interested in is the probability of relevance. It's our signal. You know, we typically can relabel our data using this probability of relevance instead of the probability of click. So, you know, this might work, this, is, this sounds good, but uh, how do we make sure that this is the right assumption? Because we don't know whether this assumption is correct. What we might do in practice is just train you know, a lot of these models uh, with different assumptions and then select one that you know, we think is the best and explains the data uh, in the best way. So this is how we can do this selection process. Uh, we typically have two tasks. The first one is click prediction. So it's in distribution because you, know, you take your data set, you split it randomly into train and test. And then on the test set, you can use any binary classification metric like log likelihood to measure the goodness of fit of your model. So that's great because uh, we want a model that fits the data well, of course, uh, but it doesn't tell you anything about whether uh, you know, the click prediction, prediction still holds when you change the ranking. So that's why we have a second task, which directly evaluates this um, like a relevant probability, which is uh, what we want to, to get. Uh, so usually you collect some relevance annotations, uh, either by asking humans or by doing some kind of randomized traffic to remove the bias. And then you can use uh, metrics such as NDCG and CMI, so we'll talk a little bit about this one um, afterwards, uh, to, uh, to evaluate the quality of these scores. So that's uh, exactly what we want to do because uh, you know, these scores are supposed to be free of bias. So we make sure that you know, we have a uh, good estimate of these scores. Of course, it has some limitations because, for example, you cannot assess uh, whether the over parameters like uh, effect of position, effect of over items are correctly estimated. But um, at least you have something about the relevance probability. So here we use two metrics and, you know, we, why not just one? The problem is that NDCG alone is not enough to make sure that we have correct relevance scores. Uh, so this is kind of the same example, but I have switched items and now they are ordered by decreasing amount of relevance. So as you can expect, this one, is, the first one is favored by both relevance and observation probability. So it has a very high click probability. And now if you train an AID model that does not account at all for bias, uh, well, you see that the order is actually correct, right? So um, when you compare it to relevance annotations, then you have an NDCG of one. So it's a perfect model, but we know that this model is not great because it's, it doesn't account for bias. So now if I change the ranking, the click probability is completely off. So that's why we need to look at a different criterion. And um, that is the, the biasedness. So it's the idea that you know, if these scores are truly free of bias, you shouldn't see any remaining influence of the logging policy or behavior policy onto uh, the model predictions. 
um, you know, if you, there is still kind of a remaining correlation, uh, then it means that, you know, there is still some bias that has been transferred from the looking policy to the model. And mathematically speaking, that is a conditional independence relationship, which we can test for using conditional mutual information. So I'm not going to describe exactly the, the details of the computation, but basically, basically we are looking for remaining correlations between model prediction and logging policy prediction. Uh, this is how it works in practice. So here, same example with position bias. We have trained one model um, uh, that is a naive model. It's the DCTR. And the PBM, which is the correct model, it, yeah, it has a correct assumption. And so it really, it really removes the bias. Then, uh, if you look at the NDCG, it's basically the same. Actually, the naive model is slightly better, even though it is uh, really biased. But when you look at the, um, the, condition, the conditional mutual information metric, you see that there is still a significant remaining correlation for the naive model. And uh, the correct model has completely removed the bias. Uh, you know, if you look at it visually here, um, for example, uh, for the column number three, you see that there is a clear upward trend. So there is a correlation between the logging policy scores and the model scores. And if you look at the PBM, you know, it makes mistakes because it's not a perfect model, but at least there is no correlation. All right, um, so takeaways, uh, there is uh, uncertainty because of selection bias. So we have to do something against it. Otherwise we fall into the deadly triad and it is a critical failure of, of NRL. So we have some techniques that apply penalties to do that. And you know, if, even then the feedback that we get is a bit unreliable. So we have to kind of apply correction using click modeling. Uh, and once again, this is a little bit tricky because um, then you you have to resort to distributional metrics such as CMIP to, to have a proper evaluation. Okay, um, now we have basically a plan, something that could work in theory. I just want to show now that, you know, sometimes when you go into practice, you have some issues and a, a major one is uncertainty. You have uncertainty everywhere in the recommender system. So first it could be in the policy itself because, you know, you have some business rules, uh, so uh, sometimes, you know, an item has to be promoted for some reason and it overrules the choice of the algorithm. So it, in the data, it looks like uncertainty. Uh, you can also have a stochastic policy. For example, if you are trying to solve a fairness task, it's sometimes useful to have a stochastic policy. You have uncertainty in the reward function uh, because, you know, even two users who have a very similar state who look exactly the same in the data can uh, have different uh, responses. Maybe they are just actually in a different mood today, or they didn't uh, really look uh, you know, deep enough to get all of the information they need to make their choice. So you have uncertainty there. You also have uncertainty here in the transition function, uh, because you know, once again, uh, even two users who look exactly alike will have different user responses. They can come back to the platform also earlier or later, which you know, creates some uncertainty. Uh, so once again, we cannot really approximate this very accurately. There is uncertainty in the world, of course, and we're never going to predict everything happening in the world. So we have to take that into account. And lastly, there is also epistemic uncertainty. So that means, you know, uncertainty that could be reduced in theory if you had more data, but you don't have more data, so you have to accept it. Um, typically, you know, you never truly know your user well. Uh, you cannot really estimate their user preference because you don't have enough data. They change all the time. So you just have to accept it and still take a decision. All right, so that's a lot of potential issues. And I'd just like to kind of stay general here and say that, you know, uncertainty, it can make training harder, but actually a little bit of uncertainty is good. It's actually required sometimes. Um, so this is uh, about the uncertainty in the policy. You know, if you want to train an offline RL method out of the behavior policy, um, the quality of the, the initial policy really matters. Uh, if it is random, then uh, the data is highly suboptimal and also not focused towards the good parts of the space where you would need like enormous amounts of data. And usually the performance is not great. If you have a fully deterministic policy, you have no variability in the data, which means that you cannot learn anything. So you cannot do better than this deterministic policy. You are constrained by it. So it is possible that you know the performance looks like this. Um, 
you know, it's sometimes a bit hard to draw this graph uh, because many things move. For example, if you touch the stochasticity, you also touch usually the suboptimality. Uh, but that's still something you can observe. For example, when you have a medium performing policy that is fully deterministic, you cannot do better than it. But if you add some suboptimal data to it, you add variability and then the performance actually improves. Then uh, this is another example of these trade-offs. This one is in the reward function. And this is actually a very simple experiment that you can reproduce. So um, if you uh, generate user and item embeddings in your favorite way, then you can define a relevance probability, which would be basically the dot product of user embeddings and the item embeddings. And to convert that to a click probability, you could pass it to, into a function like a sigmoid function typically. And if you control the parameters of the sigmoid, make it you know, um, more like a step function, like in this extreme, or more like this, you can control the stochasticity of the reward function. Because you know, if it is a step function, it's basically fully deterministic. So if an item is relevant, it is clicked. If it is not, it is not clicked. And if it is like this, uh, you know, uh, even a very, very relevant item could be non-clicked and vice versa. So it's very stochastic. And perhaps surprisingly, the amount of data that you need to correctly estimate your user usually looks like this. So if you have a lot of noise in your reward, you need a lot of data to, uh, you know, to get a better estimate. I think that's uh, quite logical. But if you have a perfectly deterministic um, click uh, function here, uh, then you cannot make the distinction between a slightly relevant item and a very relevant item, because both in both cases, we are clicked. Uh, all the time. So uh, that means that you would need to uh, see the feedback on many different items in order to uh, estimate the user probability, the user uh, preference, sorry. And usually, you know, there is kind of a sweet spot in the middle. Uh, unfortunately, it's a bit hard to control for this. We don't really have uh, anything we can do to position ourselves on the trade-off or not directly. So we have to, to accept it. Um, so now I just want to you know, show in practice uh, how that can be a problem. Um, typically, if you add, if you take a, a simulated experiment and you add uh, uncertainty gradually, you can see that the performance will typically decrease. Uh, so here, these are two types of uncertainty. First one is adding risky recommendations. So it's items that are either love or hate. So very, very stochastic. The second type is in the retention mechanism. So here you say that, you know, people might stay longer on the platform or for a shorter amount of time. And you have no way of controlling that and of knowing why. So it's just uncertainty for your model. And what we can see is that, yeah, usually you know, uh, models uh, are not really robust, especially to risky recommendations. But still, some models are more robust than others. For example, the IQL model retains a pretty good performance, but the PRL model really degrades in both cases. And um, this is actually quite logical because this PRL model, it belongs to a uh, larger family of models, uh, which is called Future Condition Supervised Learning or Upside Down RL. And I think the most uh, well-known algorithm from this class is the Decision Transformer. And the idea here is that, you know, given a state, if a designer will fix a desired outcome, so for example, the amount of return that you can get, and then the model learns in a supervised way what is the most likely action to get this desired outcome. So that works great in many cases, actually. But uh, when you have uncertainty, it's pretty bad. And this is the reason why. So let's say you have two actions. One is very risky, and the other always gives kind of this um, average performance. So if you look at the expected value, actually, the second one is better. But now let's say uh, you, know, you are a um, practitioner and you look at your data and say, oh, I was able to get 100 in my data. That's the maximum I got. So this is what I want to reproduce. You know, th this is the outcome I want. So you say, I want R equals 100. And then the model selects rightfully the most likely action for that, which is action A. But once you try it in the real world, suddenly uh, you are very disappointed because uh, now the expected value is only one. So that's what you will observe on average. So yeah, basically it's a bit different from proper offline RL methods because it doesn't really approximate the same thing. Um, and there is you know, work on this. And I would just advise basically not using this type of method or using them with fixes because some people are working on the fixes. 
yet. I mean, even if we uh, want to use proper offline or methods, uh, they are not perfectly robust to uncertainty, far from that. So there is definitely a lot of work to do here. Um, so uh, some takeaways, um, uncertainty is high. Actually, a little bit is good, but too much is detrimental. And uh, in general, offline RL uh, is more robust than uh, upside down RL. Okay, I just I would just like to um, maybe say that um, you know I've been sometimes a bit of a downer saying this is tricky, this is hard, uh, we're not there yet, and so on. But I think there are some recent successes that are quite encouraging, both in deploying RL into real recommendation platforms and also you know, in other domains, a scaling offline RL, for example. And so yeah, I think you know it's quite encouraging, and also this is super ambitious, you know, trying to tackle the dynamic aspect of recommendation. And even small improvements, small things that are very robust are actually, I think, a good step forward. So yes, there is a lot of work. And actually what I've said today is just scratching the surface because you have many other questions when it comes to uh, the dynamic aspect of recommendation. So uh, yeah, definitely lots of work uh, to do. Uh, I'll take some questions yeah i'm uh, about uh the time so that's fine 